Shouldn't make fun of him. He wouldn't like it. Girl, I don't give a shit what he'd like. He took out my eye. And if I ever see him again, I'm going to cut open his head and I'm going to eat his brain. I'm going to cut your heart out with a spoon. Then it begins. <laughs> Welcome to the Mad Max Minute Presents Waterworld H2O Minutes at a Time. I'm Rick. And I'm Julia. And today we're talking about Minutes 121 and 122, which begin with Deacon turning his attention to Enola's tattoo and end with Helen and the Mariner sitting on the burned wreck of the Trimoran. We saw a lot of the Deacon being good cop last week. Now it's time to get down to business. Oh my goodness, he switches so fast and... Quite violently. This was a very interesting conversation. I do really appreciate where the chunks cut off between last week and this week. We do delightfully get to open this week with, now that tattoo on your back, let's change topics. He has put in his dues being nice and trying to conversate a little bit, explain where he's coming from, but now let's get some information out of this kid. And he continues on the good cop path. At the moment, he's playing dumb cop, which I can personally attest to, that works. Playing dumb absolutely works. Right. Everybody loves to be right. Everybody loves to be seen as an authority on a subject, especially kids. Mm -hmm. Kids who are always talked down to day in and day out because they've got no life experience to speak of. Right. And when they're given the opportunity to be an expert on something, walk up to any kid and ask them about Fortnite, and they will talk your ear off. A Pokemon, oh my goodness. Minecraft, don't even get me started. Actually, don't get my nephew started. <laughs> yeah. That's the name of the game. <laughs> so the deacon plays this kind of dumb. So I've been told that it's actually a map. He knows very well it's a map. He is giving Enola the opportunity, like you said, to be the expert, and she takes the bait. Mm -hmm. She is smart enough to know that he is a bad man and that he shouldn't be given dry land. She knows that, but yet she gives him information anyways because he sweet-talked her. Mm -hmm. He chit-chatted, he played dumb, he let her be the expert, and she gave him information. She's got the promise of getting a marker, or in the book it was a crayon, there's not much more deviation from the movie in the book, so I'm not going to reference it this week. Okay. But there are certain understandings that Enola believes have come forward. And so when she says it's the way to dry land, it's a not exactly tit for tat offering, but he was nice. What reason does she have to hide this from her point of view? And the deacon is very happy to get this information. He claps his hands a little bit, says, ah, now we're getting someplace. And I love how he looks off to the side as if to look at Nord and the doctor and be like, yeah. ah, see, this is why I'm the boss, because <laughs> I get results. Uh, yeah. No poison from a puffer fish needed. Right. I absolutely love how the conversation proceeds after this. Deacon says, now we're getting someplace. Can you teach me how to read it? She shakes her head no. And this is a point where Many movies take the opportunity of misunderstanding what that no means. Many movies would take this as a no, I will not teach you how. And the villain says, okay, well, then I'll torture it out of you. Something like that. But he immediately understands that shake of the head means she can't teach him because she doesn't know. I think of everyone who has ever seen that tattoo, Enola has seen it the least. So when it comes to looking at that tattoo and being able to say, this means that, that means that, et cetera, et cetera, there's no way she can do it. Right. Gregor is the expert, quote unquote, expert <laughs> yeah. on this tattoo. Yeah. Which the deacon immediately recognizes exactly what you just said, that Enola may not know how to read it, but she's probably been around adults who have tried to read it and have discussed it around her. Mm -hmm. So the next step is to say, hey, what have you heard other people talking about? In the book, Enola says 
when she's explaining what the tattoo is, Gregor says it's a map to dry land. So she attributes that information to another adult. She doesn't do it here in the movie, probably because they realized that Deacon would have no context for who Gregor is. Right. So and it the, wouldn't matter saying the name out loud. Ooh. So I was going to say that us, the viewer, don't care about Gregor anymore. But listeners, we're going to care about Gregor in a couple of weeks. <laughs> so it actually might have been a good idea to remind us, the viewer, of his existence. Now, that might have worked. The Deacon makes a mistake by when he's talking about, have you heard adults talking about your tattoo, of insulting the Mariner. Yeah. He assumes that because he doesn't like the Mariner, because he doesn't like his very existence, neither did the Atollers, nobody does. He assumes that because nobody else likes the Mariner, that Enola doesn't like him either. I think he doesn't even fathom that it might not be the most appropriate thing to insult this man in front of Enola. I don't think it even occurs to him to continue sweet-talking her by not insulting the mariner, but he does. Yeah, calls him a pet fish. Anola very quickly turns because she seemed to be in a sharing mood as far as information is concerned. Yeah. And as soon as that pet fish comment comes out, the tracks switch, and the only thing she has to say is, you shouldn't make fun of him. He wouldn't like it. You wouldn't like him when he's angry. <laughs> exactly. She has seen him when he's angry. Have you seen my hair? <laughs> this is what happens when he's angry. We mentioned Anola switching on a dime, but the deacon Ooh. swings wildly wow. from being amiable to being downright hostile. Just like you said earlier in this episode, he gets downright nasty telling her, girl, I don't give a shit what he'd like. He took out my eye. Right. As, as much as Enola likes the Mariner, the Deacon has every reason to hate this guy. I see people's attitudes towards the Mariner as bigotry. I know it's not a race thing. It's not a color thing. It's a mutation thing. Yeah. But the sentiment is the same. It's a species thing at the end of the day. Because yeah. as a mutant, he is now a different. apart from Homo sapien. Right. So he's got two things that he hates about the Mariner. He's a bigot. He hates him because he's not 100% human. And he also hates him because he's responsible for losing his eye. Never mind the boat the, and fuel and lives that he lost. He's mad about his eye. Right. <laughs> I mean. But, you know, whatever. Smokers are expendable. He's got right. more of them I mean, all over the Ds. He is the villain. So. Right. You know what? As the adult in the situation, the deacon had an opportunity to walk back his insult and reroute Enola back to the amiable conversation that they were just having, where he was actually getting somewhere. But no, no, he just he goes off the deep end. Well, it's hard. A, pardon the on the nose metaphor here, but the cut that the mariner dealt him runs really deep. Not only is the deacon out a bunch of fuel and a bunch of guys, as we've said, he is permanently disfigured. Yes, and that may impede his ability to lead, mm -hmm. more by reputation. We saw him golfing earlier, and I don't know if he meant to hit that pile of cans the way he did, but it could be that his golf game really is thrown off by the loss of his depth perception, and yeah, so that's just adjust another that. wound. And the deacon does not strike me as the kind of guy who is willing to talk through his feelings. Be like, oh, I have suffered this loss. This is how I feel about it. This is how I'm processing this rage. So it's just boiling up inside of him. Yep. And it comes out at the slightest provocation. And Enola is the slightest provocation. <laughs> yes. I, I dare say she is more than a slight provocation. I do like where you're coming from, where if the deacon had been able to keep himself under control, that he could have steered her back and possibly kept this interrogation going, sort of apologize by proxy to the Mariner for the fish comment and get back on track. Yeah, it would have been really easy to walk it back. It would have been two lines. Oh, gosh, I'm sorry. Like, oh, you like him. Okay, then I will respect him. Sorry mm -hmm. about that. And then kept going. But... It's really startling, his turn. He is a warlord in a post-apocalypse. 
warlords in the post-apocalypse do not say i'm sorry very, very they true. are always right they are always in charge they are not to be opposed else someone stronger in theory would come along and e depose them yes very much so he is absolutely playing to type here and i wish that was just a description for post-apocalyptic warlords but i think a lot of people i don't want to say men in charge i'm going to say people in charge it goes to their heads and they do not like being challenged it is their way or the highway uh, the deacon would very much love to be able to have a highway so that he could tell people to go on to it when they wanted to go a different way <laughs> one of his driving motivations i want a highway to take my car out onto one of the comebacks that Anola uses that I particularly love, she says, you can't kill him. He's even meaner than you are. And I really like that because Enola loves him for who he is. She sees that he is mean and crotchety and nobody likes him, but she does. He's a junkyard dog. Yes. For the people who work at the junkyard, that dog is the sweetest, most loyal watchdog that they could ever ask for. But to everybody else, heaven help you if it gets a hold of you. Right. Sort of a pit bull. <laughs> and it feels far-fetched that she goes on to say, he'll come for me. He will. And she is so sure. That seems so out of character and outlandish to the Mariner that we have been getting to know. But she's right. It really shows the difference between... What we're seeing as adults, looking from an adult point of view, at the interactions that the Mariner is having with Helen versus the interactions that Enola is having with the Mariner. As far as Enola is concerned, as soon as he taught her how to swim unprovoked, every instance after that, Enola is on the Mariner's side. She is the one who is concerned with his injury after the trading post. And Helen is saying all of these things about how he wants to sell them, but those are just words. I don't think Enola puts as much stock in intention as Helen does, being an adult with adult experiences. So as far as she's concerned, he was nice once. He will continue to be nice. He is going to come to rescue her. I don't want to gloss over the second part of the deacon's comments about the mariner though because the deacon said if i ever see the mariner again i'm going to cut open his head and he's going to eat his brain okay well you might as well if he doesn't see the mariner as human it's weird because we see kevin costner kevin costner is a human so we know that he has these mutations and nobody in this world considers him human including himself he says, I think in next week's clips, maybe the week after, he says himself that I may not be human, but yada, yada, yada. So if nobody considers the Mariner human, then eating his brains, whether that's figurative or literal, isn't cannibalism and is not taboo. Right. It's sushi. Right. It's <clears throat> nutritious. This comment reminds me of a movie that I've never seen. Uh-huh. 2001's Hannibal. Starring Anthony Hopkins, he comes back as Hannibal Lecter, and there is a scene where he captures a character, ties them down to a chair, cuts off the top of their head, and then starts picking out little bits of his brain and cooking it on a hot plate there at the table. And it's a very tense scene, because any scene with Anthony Hopkins is tense. Right. <laughs> I'm curious. You said you hadn't seen the movie but perhaps you know anyways. I'm curious at what point the person dies. Well, that's the tricky thing about the brain is that there are no pain receptors in the brain. Right. You still have to slice open the skull. Like there are pain receptors in your scalp. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you could do that local anesthetic. But once you get through that, there's no pain receptors in your skull the bone itself. And then the brain, no. So, yeah. It's Ray what? Liotta, by the way. Is who he's got tied to the chair. He eats Ray Liotta's brain. Yeah, and then oh he goodness. feeds a little bit of Ray Liotta's brain to him. So he's still alive. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Well, I know the frontal lobe you can live without. So as long as you don't bleed out, mm -hmm. which speaks to something that Hannibal is known for is his skill. Right. He is very precise in what he does. So if anybody were able to 
cut open a man's head and eat his brain and the man still be alive, it's Hannibal. Now, I actually kind of want to run out and watch Hannibal now because it's got Anthony Hopkins. We've watched the Hannibal TV show Uh a bunch, and I think there are some characters that cross over there. The one thing that gives me pause is the fact that they recast Clarice from... Oh, Jodie Foster. From Jodie Foster to Julianne Moore, which I like Julianne Moore on a normal day. Oh, you know what? As a recast, that's pretty good. It's a shame they recast her, though. It would have been nice to see her come back. But yeah. as a recast, that's not bad. Anyway, the deacon is not someone who would be careful when it comes to brain eating. Yeah, the doctor would be in charge of that. And we've seen the doctor do bodily things. And it's not pretty, it's not delicate, it's not precise, it's not sanitary. It would be kind of like Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom. I was thinking about the monkeys. (laughs) That's what I was thinking about. Like this whole time, I was thinking about serving them up like the monkeys. Funnily enough, (laughs) I kind of thought of the chef scene from Little Mermaid. Where you've got the mariner scrambling around the kitchen and this giant chef is trying to hack away at him with a meat cleaver. First, he cuts off the head and he pulls out pulls the bones. The bones. <laughs> <laughs> that was like the first French I ever learned. Right. Because it's French mixed with English in a sort of French accent. But that was like my introduction to, hey, here's some French. Mm-hmm. In response to Enola talking about how the mariner is meaner than the deacon, the deacon observes that the mariner is not currently here. He says that the Mariner is not coming and that, in fact, no one is going to save her. To which Enola replies, that's hogwash. He is coming. He will. I love how the deacon says, well, you better tell me what I want to know or he can save what's left of you in a goddamn jar. He is very descriptive of the violence that he would like to do. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's crazy because we don't really see the deacon do any of that sort of thing elsewhere in the movie. Like, even when they went to the trading post and they killed all the slavers, it's not like they mutilated them more than shooting them in the head and stringing them up like puppets. Right. Which would have been a violent scene to watch, but we didn't get to see it. And the deacon certainly didn't do it. An act of violence that we did see the deacon do is shooting the mariner. And that was... From a distance, that was at range, and that was very detached. It was surprisingly clean, actually. Yeah. But you know that there are smokers on that boat that would gladly do this sort of violence at the deacon's command. Absolutely. We get a lot of close-up shots of Dennis Hopper in this scene. Are you surprised by how white his teeth are? Oh my gosh, I can't believe we both thought of that. Well, I can, because with these close-ups, you can't help but look at his teeth. I always wonder and marvel at movies in general that everybody's teeth are so nice, especially in poor living conditions, like a post-apocalyptic movie. We've definitely mentioned it before. Yeah, like people should have no teeth. Right. And for a faction of people called the smokers, every single one of them should have nicotine and tar-stained teeth. Absolutely. You know what? There's probably a shipping container full of teeth whitening strips <laughs> that have survived the how many hundreds of years between modern day and then. Right. If they're sealed in plastic, mm-hmm. then that is a good start. Right. Right. But the deacon seems to have had enough. He says that he is glad that they had an opportunity to have this little chat. And because he is not being the good cop anymore... He commands his jailer to chain Enola once again. Interestingly enough, in the theatrical version of this movie, after he says, no, I'm glad we had this little talk, the scene ends. Oh. We don't get the added chain her, chain her up with Enola calling after the deacon saying that he'll come for me. We don't get that extra little bit, but I like that it's included in the extended edition because he started off this scene saying, what are you, a barbarian? Unchain her. This is terrible. And he ends the scene by having her rechained. It's a great way to wrap up this good cop, bad cop, I can do this all by myself thing that he's got going on. Mm. Before we go back to the burnt out Trimoran, okay. we need to put a quota on you saying the word gross. I will 
try my very best not to say it at all. Okay. We zoom in on Helen and the Mariner, and the first words out of Helen's mouth is her asking, we're going to die here, aren't we? And sure, things look a little bleak. They've got no boat. They've got no sails, no provisions, no idea where to find the smokers. But hey, at least they've got their health. Neither of them are currently sick right now. That's a silver lining. Kevin Costner has a hole in him. Okay, uh, Helen is mostly healthy then. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) So not all is lost, right? Oh no, they're going to die there. They're absolutely going to die there. They do have the advantage of the Mariner being his fishy self. Mm -hmm. So that is handy, and that can absolutely be used to their advantage. But without some kind of support to help them get back up on their feet, yeah, they're going to die there. It is awfully convenient that they are currently parked over the flooded city of Denver. And if they needed to source materials from somewhere, there currently exists a city remnant, a population center, that the Mariner can dive down and salvage. I don't know if the Mariner could necessarily handle free diving down there without any sort of winch support to bring things to the surface. That would be very tricky. But in theory... He could lash together what rope survived the fire and give Helen one end and swim down with the other. And then when he finds something, I don't know, maybe uh, find a sporting goods store in Denver and find a few (laughs) kayaks. That's the nice thing about boats is once you get the water out of them. There are boats again. There are boats. Yeah. Yeah. And I do want to point out that in the remainder of these two minutes, he is messing around with rope. Mm -hmm. So she... Being an atoller has always had a support system set up and things go wrong. I'm sure sections of the atoll sink. A group of people get sick and die unexpectedly. Like they have setbacks, but they have enough of a system in place that they can handle those and recover from them. So from her point of view, this is nothing. They have nothing. There is no hope. We're going to die here. And the Mariner has a completely different point of view. That he's always been on his own. He's always had to make do and just handle the crises that come along. I do want to point out, though, that one of the very last shots we get in these two minutes, the Mariner kind of throws down the rope and looks so dejected. So, yeah, he's in a better position to handle this emotionally, but even he's not doing that great. Yeah, he'll be able to bounce back for sure, but... Helen is so poorly equipped to existence on a water world. All of the regular humans are. It's going to be said in future episodes that people are not meant for water world. Exactly, exactly. I don't want to step on future us's toes (laughs) by going too far into that. What I find really interesting about the end of this two minutes is that the Mariner tosses aside that rope. He looks a little dejected. And Helen, who is sitting nearby, reaches out and initiates contact. She touches him, which is something that isn't normally done between the two of them. And I find it interesting, like, despite all of the venom and distrust between them, the fighting, the misdirection, the lying, the deceiving, I'm just saying the same word, but from different entries in the thesaurus. (laughs) But despite all of that, they are now the only two people in the world that they can rely on. Despite their differences, They have to come together in this moment. And I guess the only way that Helen can think to do that is to reach out to the Mariner, not hop to and try and be productive, because what is she going to do? She doesn't have gills. She doesn't have all of these seafaring abilities. She's a homebody. But she can reach out to him and say, you know what? We are together in this. And that's how I interpret her reaching out to him. I agree. We were chatting with some friends the other day about love languages. You and I have been over this extensively, especially on the podcast. And physical touch is a love language. And in this scene, she is exhibiting that that is how she is showing connection, caring for him, caring about what happens to him, along with what happens to herself, is that she is touching him. Mm -hmm. 
not sure the Mariner has a love language, but there, I don't really want to ana- analyze that. <laughs> there will be plenty of time for that conversation next week. <laughs> so we're going to put a pin in this for now. Come back next time. Helen will remind us of an earlier scene, then initiate an intimate moment with the Mariner, and we'll see him, after the fact, salvage a box. The Mad Max Minute podcast is a fan project by Rick and Julia Ingham. Waterworld was written by Peter Rader and David Tui, directed by Kevin Reynolds, and presented by Universal Pictures. Mad Max Minute is produced and edited by Rick Ingham. Our opening music is Verdi's Dies Irae by Daniel Batista of DanielBatista.com. Our home on the internet is MadMaxMinute.com. You can follow us on Twitter at MadMaxMinute. And like us on Facebook by searching MadMaxMinute and join our Facebook listener group, MadMaxMinute Beyond Microphone. If you'd like to support the podcast, visit Patreon.com slash MadMaxMinute. Thank you for joining us for Waterworld Episode 61. We'll see you next time.